What a joy that you have found us for this podcast. How exciting it is to think that this spiritual message is going out to people around this planet. Whether your life is working at a peak level or whether it can use some enhancement, have I got the message for you today. So get a piece of paper, get ready to take notes, call a friend, have them watch this podcast also. Then you too can have something to talk about and take it to a deeper level. So enjoy. Here we go. Good morning and Happy New Year. What an honor it is to be here on this beautiful Sunday between the celebrations of light of Christmas and Hanukkah and the winter solstice and the new year. And we truly are on the verge of this new year full of, full of possibilities, of infinite possibilities, pregnant with whatever it is that we create for this new year. And it's an honor to be here while Dr. Christian is on his vacation for one last Sunday. And did you all have a blessed Christmas? Good, good. I had a wonderful time. I just got back from Ohio, and I love the fact that we embrace all spiritual paths because on Christmas Day, I did a service at my mother's Methodist retirement community. <laughs> so it was pretty cool. <laughs> And so today I'm going to be talking about a new vision. And to begin, I'd like to read from a book by Jill Carroll called Dialogue of Civilizations about a man who has this vision about which I'm going to talk today, the same vision that Reverend Diane so beautifully read about our global heart vision. And this is his story. His followers are committed to a vision of global peace and progress through education and interfaith dialogue. His movement is a social and spiritual one. He has introduced a new style of education that begins to integrate scientific knowledge and spiritual values. Does that sound sort of like our Wisdom for Life school that we have here? He believes that the real goal of nations is the renewal of individuals and society through moral action. He explains that only through cooperative understanding and respect can communities coexist in peace. Through his guidance, we can create a world where dialogue is our first course of action and confrontation is our very last. He has inspired three generations of men and women to create a new world. He is a man of deep spirituality integrity, and compassion. His message of altruism and education has inspired millions into service for humanity. So who is this great spiritual leader? It's not Ernest Holmes, the founder of our path, Religious Science. It's not even any United Church of Religious Science, United Centers for Spiritual Living, or New Thought Minister. It's not a Hindu or someone who's Jewish or someone who is of any other faith except for one. His name is Fatula Gulen, and he's a Muslim. And he has been preaching since 1958 a, a, a message of love, a message of compassion, a message of a world that works for everyone. And uh, today I'm going to talk about the vision that I saw when I was invited to Turkey in May by some of his followers. His followers are so committed to peace and understanding and dialogue on this planet that they fund schools, they fund universities, they fund media, TV stations and newspapers, and then they pay for people like me to go to Turkey. I was amazed. The, and the reason that I got invited was because I was active in our Interfaith Ministerial Association, and then I had my ordination, and Michael Paul sang at my ordination, and some of my friends from the Interfaith group came, and three days after that, I was elected the first female president of the organization in, the, in its 20-year history. So because of that, thank you. 
<laughs> Actually, I'm completing my two-year term. I'll be, I'll be done, and someone else will do it starting in February. But, but the people who are followers of Fatula Gulen in San Diego heard about me because of that and invited me to one of their interfaith dialogue dinners. And after that, I started going to their events and became friends with them. And out of that, I got invited to Turkey. I was with an amazing group of people. The purpose of our trip was interfaith dialogue. And there were clergy from all over the country. There was the Episcopal Bishop from Northern California. There was the first Episcopalian minister, or Episcopalian priest who was a woman who was ordained in Northern California. There was a Methodist minister who had a congregation of a thousand people in Sacramento. There was the director of interfaith community services from Sacramento who was a Presbyterian minister. There was a widow of a conservative Jewish rabbi from New Jersey. There was a woman who goes around the world teaching people in developing countries how to develop in sustainably, environmentally responsible manners. And then there was me. And then I got to try to explain to all these amazing people, well, was I religious science? Am I United Centers for Spiritual Living? Am I New Thought? Am I a real minister? What is all of this? And I'll tell you a little bit later about how that all, all came full circle and people finally understood. So throughout this amazing trip, this was one of the highlights of my life. I came back from this trip absolutely knowing knowing that peace is possible on this planet right here and now. Despite the assassination of Budo last week, despite all the appearances of wars and all the things that are happening on this planet, there are millions of Muslims who are connected with people like us who truly have a vision for peace and for dialogue and for celebrating our differences. And I came back with that absolute, true internal knowledge. It was a wonderful trip. They took us to all kinds of places. The, they, we had to pay for the plane fare to and from Istanbul, but they paid for everything else. They paid for guides. We went to the Hagia Sophia, which is the big mosque. Well, now it's a museum. It was, it was a mosque at one time. It was the first church for the Eastern Orthodox religion when Constantine force broke off from Rome and started the Byzantine Empire. We, they flew us down to near Ephesus, the, the ruins of Ephesus where Paul, the founder of Christianity, spoke. And I got to walk the streets of those people who walked there 2,000 years ago, seeing the Temple of Diana and standing where Paul spoke to the Ephesians and just feeling that energy through, throughout the country. They flew us down to the Mediterranean where we could go swimming in the Mediterranean. And I'm staying in this five-star hotel that they have paid for. I'm just so moved because I'm thinking of all these millions of Muslims who have paid for me to have this experience. They flew us to the eastern part of Turkey where we saw the, the churches that the Cappadocian fathers had carved out of rock for the Eastern Orthodox religion. We went to an underground city. If you will read about it in, you'll read about it in the Bible where the Hittites were going to, were trying to invade the Israelites and they, they went to this underground city in what is now Turkey, a hundred miles of underground city. And so the, the tourist part was all well and good and it was wonderful, but that was not the highlight of it. What the highlight of that trip was, was the people that we met. These amazing people who put their time, their talents, and their money where their mouths are to truly bring about a world that works for everybody. So I'd like to read a quote from Fatula Gulen about love, which these people absolutely practice and show to all of us. Love is the most essential element in every being, a most radiant light and a great power that can resist and overcome every force. 
overcoming every force, no matter what's going on in the world. Love elevates every soul that absorbs it. For us to experience a new nationwide resurrection is dependent on a few dozen heroes who will be the life in our bodies and the blood in our veins. A few dozen heroes who will have reached the lights of the truth beyond the horizon of knowledge. I beg to differ with Gulen a little bit, though, because I met way more than a few dozen heroes when I was in Turkey. Turkey, as you may know, is partly in Europe and mostly in Asia. And for centuries, they have seen themselves as the bridge between the East and the West. And the people that we met there that are representatives of millions of other people truly see themselves not only as the bridge between the East and the West, but the bridge between Muslims and the rest of the world. And they practiced what they preached. The, we went to visit a lot of business associations. Wherever we went, we were fed. We were treated like kings and queens. And, and we would have lunch or breakfast with these business associations. And they would talk about this, this whole idea of cooperation and a world that works for everybody. And even in their business practices, they, they show this. They don't have competition like we have. They truly believe that they all cooperate and help each other. And as they help each other, they all are risen up. Wouldn't that be wonderful if we did that in our world for this new year? If we, we allowed ourselves to have a new vision of cooperation through our workplaces, just like my friends in Turkey did. We met some amazing people in the schools that we went to. They have these things called Turkish schools, and they're all funded by the followers of Gulen, and they're very, very high academic standards where they teach science. They don't teach Islam, but they teach science and math, and, and they teach English. All the kids learn English, and it's sort of like our Wisdom for Life school here, where they are learning, and they're learning spiritual principles at the same time. We met one teacher who had really put his life on the line for his belief in education because Fatula Gulen believes that the only way out of the morass of, of the hatred in this world is education. And so this teacher that we met who was teaching in Turkey at that time we met him told us a story about when he was in Afghanistan. They put these Turkish schools in all of the places in the world. There's some in America, too. But they especially want to put them in trouble spots in the world. So they had a Turkish school in Afghanistan. And there were three people who were teaching at that school who were followers of Gulen. And when the bombs started dropping and the war broke out in Afghanistan, the soldiers told the teachers they had to leave. And the teachers said, no way. We are totally committed to education. We're totally committed to these kids. And we know that if we leave, these kids will never come back and these kids will never have an education. So despite what they were ordered to do, they stayed in that schoolhouse for three months with the bombs dropping all around them until things kind of settled down a little bit. And finally, the kids were allowed to come back and the kids came back to school. And I'm passionate about peace in the world, but when I heard that story, I'm wondering, am I that passionate? Would I have been willing to put my life on the line for education, it, for spiritual education in, and, uh, in a world that works for everybody like this teacher was? Would you? We met a businessman who was, had a very prosperous business and when things started having, when they started having trouble in Bosnia, they decided to put a Turkish school in Bosnia. So he went to Bosnia, left his family, left his business for three months just to start that Turkish school. How many of us would be willing to do something like that? We went to factories, we went to businesses, we went to this one factory where we had breakfast with the owner and all of the employees, and the owner was speaking in Turkish through an interpreter so passionately about the way they practice their business in cooperation and so passionately about dialogue and a world that works for everybody that he was in tears. 
This is about a 70-year-old man in Turkey. And of course, we cried. We cried a lot. Everybody cried. We went to, they, they flew us to this little tiny airport out into the eastern part of Turkey, and then we went on this four-hour bus ride to this little town called Nida. And we were thinking, why in the world are we going to Nida? There's no, nothing touristy there. There's nothing for us to see. But we got there late at night, and we got to the Turkish school, and then we realized why. There were hundreds of parents and kids and faculty waiting for us with a sumptuous feast, and then the kids put on this really, really moving, moving program, partly in English and partly in Turkish, and, and it was translated a little bit. And we were, of course, at the head table, and of course, we were treated like kings and queens again. And then at the very end of the program, because it was almost Mother's Day, they asked those of us who were women to come and stand up and to be acknowledged for Mother's Day. And they gave us flowers, and they gave us paintings, and they gave us all kinds of gifts. Every place we went, they gave us gifts. And, and the Methodist minister and I are looking at each other, and we're trying so hard, so hard not to cry. And all of a sudden, we all start crying at the same time, and the families are crying, and the kids are crying. It's, it's, it's really hard to put into words how moving it was to be with these people who are so passionate about a world that works for everyone and so passionate about education that they put their time and their money and their lives on the line to do that. One highlight of my experience was when we went to visit the Association for Writers and Journalists. That is the intellectual, they're the intellectual elites of Turkey. And nothing happens in Turkey without their approval and things that they don't like don't really happen in Turkey. So we met with their vice president, and every place we went, of course, we, we went around the circle and introduced ourselves, and, and as usual, I said, well, I'm a religious science minister, and you've probably never heard of it, and you probably have never heard of New Thought, but, but then I'm the, the dean of distance education for our seminary and for the whole movement, and of course, they didn't understand that either. Eventually, I got to work saying, well, I'm, I'm a dean in the university that trains our ministers, and they got that. But it was very interesting because about a half hour later, the vice president said, have you ever heard of the Harvard Mediation Center? And my ears perked up. And then he said, well, I went on this path of Abraham walk with the Harvard Mediation Center and the Association for Global New Thought last October. And you may or may not know this, but our own Dr. Christian's involved with the Association for Global New Thought. And they worked with the Harvard Mediation Center to start up, to blaze a trail starting in Turkey and going through Syria and then ending up in Israel of the path that Abraham walked. The path that Abraham, who's the patriarch of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. And the whole purpose of that path is dialogue and in to create a world that works for everyone. So even when we have our differences, we at least talk to each other and don't fight with each other. And so he said he went on that trip the very first one that October. And I said, well, have you heard of Dr. Kathy Hearn, our denomination's spiritual community leader of United Centers for Spiritual Living? He said, yes, I walked with her. So here I am in Turkey. Someone had actually heard of New Thought in Religious Science, and they were walking, they had walked, he had walked with, with our own Dr. Kathy Hearn. So after that, they, all my colleagues thought, well, maybe she is a real minister. <laughs> So Fatula Gulen is, all, is in the, the hierarchy of, of Rumi. He follows Rumi. He's on the same path as Rumi was. And how many have heard of Rumi? Dr. Christian quoted him two weeks ago. Rumi is the great Sufi mystic who, who is from Turkey, who started the school for the whirling dervishes. And so they flew us to Konya, where... Rumi's tomb is, and they, we got to see this whirling dervish school, and we got to go into the mosque that's over Rumi's tomb. And I've had some pretty amazing mystical experiences in my life. 
But I walked into this mosque in Turkey over Rumi's tomb, and I was just paralyzed because I could feel the energy. The presence of God was so palpable that I couldn't move. And one of our guides said, are you okay? And the other, and I said, yeah, yeah, I'm just having a mystical, mystical experience. Don't worry. And all the other people were just walking around looking at things. And, and it was such, such an experience of the presence of God, that one God that is that same, same, whether we're in Turkey or whether we're here at Seaside. It's all one. So if in case you haven't heard about from Rumi for a while, I would like to read a couple of quotes from him. He says, we come spinning out of nothingness, scattering stars like dust. Everything in the universe is a pitcher bringing, brimming with wisdom and beauty. You were born with wings. Why prefer to crawl through life? Observe the wonders as they occur around you. Don't claim them. Feel the artistry moving through and be silent. And we certainly notice the artistry of spirit flowing through everyone we met there in Turkey. And one of the things that we noticed was the abundance of the universe that these people express. You know, in, in, in our denomination, we teach about the abundance of the universe, and it's all a flow, and as you give, so shall you receive, but that's not why you give. But in Turkey, the hospitality of the people that we met was so far beyond anything I could have imagined. They warned us to take an extra suitcase because we'd get gifts, and we'd, prob and we'd probably want to get souvenirs like this, this shawl that I bought, but I was totally unprepared for the magnitude of the generosity. Everywhere we went, first of all, we were fed, and then after we had breakfast or lunch, and we'd go visit something like the Association for Journalists and Authors, they'd give us snacks again. We'd go visit a family, they'd give us snacks again. And if you haven't had Turkish, homemade Turkish yogurt, you haven't lived. So I highly recommend it. And the tea they have, oh my gosh, it's nothing like the tea you have here. And someday I'm going to learn how to make it. But everywhere we went, they also gave us gifts. Lavish, amazing gifts like, like Turkish, a Turkish coffee set or, or the plates of, of the places that we visited. And one family that we stayed with, mostly we stayed in hotels, but we stayed with one family when we were in Nita. And three of us were with one particular family. And of course, they fed us. And they, in, for breakfast, they had homemade squeezed orange juice. We watched them squeeze the orange juice by hand. It was amazing. And then when we left, they gave us each a Turkish carpet. I mean, I have never felt so loved, so blessed if with the hospitality with these people. I mean, if you come to my house, you might get a cup of tea if you're lucky. But with them, everywhere they went, it was, it was just this abundance of the flow of the universe that they were giving out. And a lot of them didn't even have as much as most of us have. And they still gave. And wouldn't it be wonderful if, if as for this new year, we would make a commitment to ourselves to, to do that same kind of giving as the people in Turkey did, not only to people who visit, but to give to the places that we know help the world work for everyone, like this spiritual community. I could talk for hours about this. The one more thing I want to talk about is the way they pray. As you know, Muslims pray five times a day, and they get up at 5 in the morning to do their prayers. Then they have a prayer between the morning and noontime. And then they have the noontime prayer and then one between noontime and, eat and bedtime and then one at bedtime. And they start with these wonderful calls to prayer from the minarets that are connected with the mosques. And, and when the call to prayer happens, you can do your prayer any time between that time and the next call to prayer. So I thought everyone would stop in the middle of the streets and do their praying, and they don't do that. But it was so interesting to me that they are so committed to me, getting up at 5 in the morning to pray, I mean, I wouldn't make a terrible Muslim because there's no way I could do that. 
But they are so committed that they do that. And, and the great example and teacher Jesus said, pray without ceasing. Joel Goldsmith, whom we use in some of our classes here at Seaside, said to think, to connect with spirit every two hours. And wouldn't it be wonderful if we would take these ideas and, and think about spirit at least five times a day, even if we're on the freeway. I was quite impressed with the way they, not only the way they do the prayers with the, putting their whole bodies into it, but the places they had to pray. We were on this four-hour bus ride out to Nita, and we stopped at this gas station, and it was about 8 o'clock at night, and there wasn't, there's no one at the gas station. We were wondering, why in the world are we stopping at the gas station? So our three leaders get out of the bus, and they go into this little mini mosque that's about the size of a living room and go and pray, and they come back to the bus, and then we go on to Nita. And these little mini mosques dot the landscape. They even have one in the airport. And I thought that was so interesting to have an actual place to pray. And I know that we don't have those kinds of things here in our society, but we can certainly make room in our hearts to pray. We can certainly make room in our lives to pray at least five times a day. So what I invite us to do for this new year is to have a new vision, a new vision, a new commitment to our spiritual practices to at least commit to thinking of God five times a day. That's the least we could do. To have a new vision of that abundance of the universe flowing through and as us and a new vision for peace on this planet. I'd like to end with a quote by Fatula Gulen again. And he talks about hope. And as good religious scientists, we would call it intention and not hope. But this is what he says. And this could be Ernest Holmes. This could be any religious science minister saying this. We are on the threshold of great and far-reaching changes. The community is writhing in the birth pangs of a new time that is approaching. It is no wonder that the people are fearful, anxious, sometimes hopeless about their future. Hope is a condition of mind connected above all with belief. Those who believe have hope and their degree of hope is directly proportional to their degree of belief. You ever heard that in a science of mind class? If you haven't heard that, take Dr. Christian's foundations class that starts in January. It is because of this that certain effects of strong belief can strike some people as miracles. And those who do not experience belief on this level therefore consider such hope and belief in others as something quite out of the ordinary. And of course, in our classes, you know how to create miracles in your life. Hope consists of a man finding his spirit and seeing the potentiality that lies within it. Perceiving that, he comes into contact with the all-powerful and thereby obtains a power that can overcome everything, can even overcome things like assassinations and wars. It is by that power that a particle becomes a sun, a drop of water becomes an ocean, and it is by it, too, a man's spirit becomes the breath of the universe. Now, as many buds of hope begin to appear, multitudes of seeds are waiting under the soil for the first sign of spring. May God give hope to the despairing. And may we all begin this new year with a vision of hope, planting those seeds of intentions, of intentions for a world that works for everyone, intentions of that peace and prosperity and that love flowing through our, all, through our own lives and out into this world so that we are truly a part of this great, great vision of a world that truly does work for everyone. Thank you. So I'd like to invite the ushers to come forward as we do take our gift from our heart. Again, a lot of heart and soul and passion. Divine love, through me, blesses and multiplies all that I am.
all I that I give, give and all, all that I receive. receive. I am, am prosperous now. now. Hey, I trust you enjoyed that podcast. It was very exciting to be able to create that and to know that there are people like you all around the world that are observing and integrating these spiritual principles into their life. And so if you enjoyed it, what I'd like to do is encourage you to tell a friend or bring several friends together and watch another one of these podcasts. And then afterwards, take some time to talk about the spiritual principles, to talk about the stories and what significance they have and relevance they have in your life. What then happens is it moves to a deeper and deeper level in your world. It becomes real and assists you to create the freedom in your life that your heart and soul so desire. So if you like this, I encourage you to watch it again, but also tune into our website here at seasidecenter.org. There, um, you can get some of my written material and take a look at it. You can read some of my spiritual prayers. You can even go to our online bookstore and order some of the books. And if you're so moved, what I greatly would appreciate is your financial support, which you could do online at seasidecenter.org. It is support like yours that assists us to be able to continue to do these kinds of gifts for humanity and send it out to the world. Because you know what? We are making a difference with this spiritual message. And because of support like yours, people are being touched in the farthest reaches of this planet, as well as our backyard more than we could ever begin to realize. So I thank you from the fullness of my heart for making a difference.